Okay, well, we're continuing our studies in uh, 1 Thessalonians, and we're looking at chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. So we'll hear God's word together now. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you, because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardships. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy righteous and blameless we were among you who believed for you sorry for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God which you heard from us you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you in who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Well, may God bless that reading of his word. Um, I preached through 1 Thessalonians in the church here more than 20 years ago, and uh, I took three sermons to do this passage, so we could be here a long time tonight, but I promise we won't be. Um, Paul is writing this letter literally within a year after the church at Thessalonica was established. It was written from Corinth. It's about the year AD 50, and uh, He's heard quite a lot, as we saw from chapter 1, uh, the, the message about how the church in Thessalonica was sending out the gospel has reached him, and he's so pleased to hear that. But we need to go back and try to put ourselves in, into the situation of just 18 years or so after the death of the Lord Jesus. So we try to read into these things our modern world and, and we're not in the modern world. Now, of course, someone like Paul coming to somewhere like Thessalonica and beginning to speak in itself would not be unusual because the world at that time had many people who used to go around, philosophers and things like that, from town to town, city to city, and try to build up a following. And that's how they earned their living. And many of them were charlatans. And it seems like, as we read this chapter 2, that uh, some things were being said about the Apostle Paul that implied that he was just like the others, that he was just like them and taking advantage. And some of the things said actually uh, may be suggesting that, if you remember it, it, when the church was established, um, there were people who followed Paul, there were some Jews who followed 
followed Paul. There were some uh, devout Gentiles who followed Paul and not a few of the noble women. And so there's an implication of sexual impropriety in here as well, which is obviously something that's of great concern. So what Paul does now is he talks about his ministry. Now, this is a passage that uh, when I was in the mission, we would often use when speaking to prospective missionaries. Read this. This is how Paul saw his role as a missionary. This is how he saw what he was doing. We can't read into it everything about ministry because Paul doesn't say everything here. He just says what he did in Thessalonica and he's defending himself there. Now, Paul is anxious that these people should understand that his first priority among them was to serve God. He wasn't trying to serve them. He was trying to serve God. Now, as a consequence of serving God, he did serve them. But the point he was making was that his, his main principle was to serve God. And that's a big difference to a lot of churches that we find in our country today and in the world today. It seems like people are more concerned with serving the needs of other people with all their problems and difficulties. For example, you, you've got the lesbian and gay Christian movement and things like that. Now, I'm not being critical about lesbians and gays. That's We should love them. We should serve them. We should do everything we can to help and assist them. But we should never fail to tell them that their activities are contrary to the word of God. And that's, that's the difficulty that we have nowadays. And Paul was saying, always I was bringing you a teaching that you should live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So it's not about what you feel and about your life, but it's about God who you serve. He talks about uh, not taking advantage of them from a money point of view. And of course, nowadays the world is full of what we would call tele-evangelists, but if you go to India, there all sorts of religions have these people who go on the television. India is absolutely full of various Hindu gurus getting money off incredibly poor people, promising that they'll do something to heal them or heal a family member or things like that. So the world is full of this stuff, and Paul wants to deal with that. So. We're just going to look at three things which relate to Paul's ministerial method. But as we look at how Paul acts, I want us all to think about how does this affect me? How do I act? Because in actual fact, ministry, although more challenging, although it comes out of a, a, a call to give yourself totally to the word of God, but true ministry is no more than any Christian should have in living their life for the glory of God. But in Paul's case, he had been called to live entirely that way and, and not to have a, a, another employment particularly. So three things. The perseverance of a true minister, the transparency of a true minister's life, and the purpose of a true ministry. Three things, and we're just going to quickly whip through it and really not, not much to do too much more than headings. Okay, so the perseverance of a true minister, the first four verses. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. So, Paul says, blessing and suffering go together. So I've got to keep going. So he takes them back, doesn't he? He takes them back in their minds to when he first came to them. 
takes them back to Acts chapter 16 and chapter 17. He takes them back and says, now you remember, when I came to you, I'd come out of a prison in Philippi. I'd come having been whipped. I, well, you have to imagine that, don't you? When Paul came to them, he was probably not, I mean, we understand he was quite a small man anyway and possibly had a, a, some sort of deformity and he had a problem with his eyes. And at the moment, he's moving very stiffly from the wheels on his back, which are probably not healed by the time he comes to, Philipp, uh, to Thessalonica. And he begins, as he comes there, as he always does at that time anyway, by going into the synagogue and beginning to discuss God's word with them. What an example of perseverance that was, wasn't it? Just doing that, just coming to the, the people there and then immediately carrying on with his work after all that's happened to him in Philippi. He just says, well, this is what God's called me to do. And he, he goes on with it. And the reason he goes on with it is that he understands that blessing and suffering go together in the Christian's experience in this world. We're not going to go through this world on the top of a mountain all the time. There's going to be plenty of valleys to go through. And that's why scripture gives us so many encouragements for when times are really hard. Paul starts, doesn't he? Our visit to you was not without results. What's in his mind, first of all, was the blessing. Not the, not the persecution, not the difficulty, not the trial. But when we came to you, Look at the results. Look at what happened when God, by his spirit, came amongst you. And, and Peter dealt with that last week. And uh, so we praise God for his, well, week before last one. But we, we praise God for what he did. So blessings and suffering go together. But then he says, my motives were good. My motives were pure. And if you're going to persevere in ministry, you have to have pure motives. You have to have God as your aim. As Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 4, or 5, I think. No, maybe 4. Um, we make it our aim to please him. That's it. We make it our aim to please him. That's his motive. That's got to be our motive. That in our lives, we should make it our aim to please him. And, and because that's Paul's motive, he is able to persevere and keep going, even though times were difficult. And then he remembers that he's been given a trust by God. The gospel has been entrusted to him. Now, those of us who are trustees, several of us here are trustees of the church here, so, um, some of us are trustees of other organisations. And we know that we can't do just what we like. There are rules. The trust document has been written out in a specific way and we have been charged with making sure the trust document is carried out. In other words, we don't breach our trust. We follow our trust. We obey our trust. And Paul says, we've been entrusted with the gospel. So we're not trying to please people. We're trying to please God. And this is why we persevere. We're taking the gospel to those who need to hear it. But we're doing it because we want to please God. We know it will be good for them. We know that God, by his spirit, may use it to bring many into his kingdom. But the reason we keep going is because God has entrusted us with the gospel. Now, there's a very real sense that elsewhere in the New Testament, we're told that we've been given the gospel as a deposit. And we've got to take hold of it and keep it safe and use it for the glory of God. Of God, So the perseverance of a true minister. And then the transparency of a true minister's life, verses 5 to 10. To 10. He starts off by telling them, firstly, that he was absolutely open to them. He says to them, you know, we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. 
God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. And then he chucks this in, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Now we know that at times Paul did assert his authority. We know particularly, it's interesting that he was writing this letter in Corinth, but it was Corinth that were on the rough end of his tongue a few times. And we're not told exactly what he said to the Corinthian church. Well, we've got two letters and they're tough enough. But we know that he sent them a letter that we haven't got in the scriptures that had caused quite a lot of upset. He was ready to assert his authority, but not here. His, he was completely open to them. He did, not, he did not flatter them. The word he uses is not used anywhere else in the New Testament. Um, one of the commentators on, on the passage, and I'm just going to read what he says because it's a pointless me trying to put it in my own words. So this is Albert Barnes. The meaning is that the apostle did not deal in the language of adulation. He did not praise them for their beauty, wealth, talent, or accomplishments and conceal from them the painful truths about their guilt and danger. He stated simple truth, not refusing to commend men if truth would admit of it, and never hesitating to declare his honest convictions about their guilt and danger. One of the principal arts of the deceiver on all subjects is flattery. And Paul says that when preaching to the Thessalonians, he had carefully avoided it. He now appeals to that fact as a proof of his own integrity. They knew that he had been faithful to their souls. And I think that that's something that's true of proper ministry of God's word. He'd already said that he wanted the approval of God, not of men. And it's interesting, actually, that the approval of men the status can be more important than money to some people. It can be more important than almost anything to have the status. And we've seen an awful lot of that. In fact, it's become something that's been a recurring problem in the evangelical church too, not just churches in general, where ministers have become so all-powerful in their congregations that they've got people doing terrible things. And Paul says, no, we're not going to do that. He didn't use deception to line his own pockets. He didn't want their praise. He didn't want the status, even though he was an apostle. He didn't make anything of that. He served them. <coughs> well, when it becomes our aim to receive the praise of men, we're no more than Pharisees. Remember what the Lord Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. We're talking about it briefly this morning. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, we ought to notice in passing that Paul makes clear elsewhere that Elders and pastors and ministers are to be esteemed for their work's sake. But there's a difference between esteem and false praise. And we ought to thank God for the faithfulness of those he sets over us and to pray for them that they may be kept free from the desire for status. And then, having been that open before them, he now moves on to talk about the way his openness was revealed to them. He talks about his gentleness of spirit. Paul says he's so far from lording it over these people that he is almost the complete opposite. In, with his, in his dealings with them, he's all give and no take. So look at verses 7 to 9. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship 
we worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Now, in the translation we have here, we have uh, the Paul saying we were like young children among you. And there is no doubt that many of the manuscripts do use the Greek word for young children. But it's likely that the word should be translated gentle. We were gentle among you. If you think of the, the way the, 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 the sentence runs, um, there's only one letter difference in the Greek language between gentle and little children. And many of the commentators are pretty clear that it should be gentle. And um, other versions do have gentle. So what Paul is saying is that he's not lauding it. He's gentle with them and caring. And then he gives a picture of his gentleness. He is like a nursing mother. Now, when I first preached on this passage, I was able to give an example of something that had happened in a prayer meeting here just at that time, um, not long before I was preaching on it. And I, I can remember it to this day. And it's interesting that it was to do with Ukraine, but some of you may have been here. I don't know. Certainly some of you weren't, but some of you may have been here. We had a visit from Pastor Daniluk from the Ukraine. Um, his daughter, Natasha, is the wife of Philip Hopkins in uh, Bindon. And uh, at the time, she just had their first baby. But Mr. Honeyset had got Pastor Daniel to come here to speak. Well, of course, he didn't speak any English. So we were all dependent on Natasha to do the translating. And she was at the front with, with a little baby. I, I can picture it now because it was right by here. Just where I am standing, really. Pastor Daniel was here and Natasha was by there. There was a door there then. And um, the baby started crying when, in the middle when she was trying to translate for her father speaking. And the baby was obviously hungry. So she very discreetly turned, uh, turned around and started feeding the baby and put a shawl around her and just carried on translating for her father. And I thought that was just such a, an amazing picture. She could have said, I've got to go and feed the baby and gone out through that door. And we would have all sat here like lemons because we couldn't understand him and he couldn't understand us. And we would have had to think of something to do. So she just said, well, I'll have to stay. So she got on with feeding the baby and carried on translating for her father. The inconvenience was not important. The needs of the baby were important and the needs of the people in the room were important and the needs of her father were important. And they took precedence over the other considerations. And could there be a more tender way than Paul to express himself about the way he cared for these people, he cared for them, he loved them, he was gentle towards them. And, uh, you know, sometimes we find it easier to be harsh than to be kind. But Paul says, we cared for you because we loved you so much. That was the spirit of the Apostle Paul. And he was like his saviour in his self-sacrificial attitude. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. As we're following Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, surely we're aware of the way he's giving himself. He's always giving himself to the people, isn't he, that come to him. Bartimaeus this morning, the, the rich young ruler last week. The children and their parents, the weak, he's giving and giving and giving. And that's how Jesus was, and that's how Paul was, and that's what true ministry is. And then thirdly, he took no money from them. He worked to pay his own way, so that he could not be criticised in this place. Now, Paul didn't always do that. We're told elsewhere that he did take money from churches and argued that it was right for him to do so. Uh, you can read it in 1 Corinthians 9, 2 Corinthians 11. You can read it in Philippians 4. Here, though, he had come to a place new with the gospel, with no church, and he did not want anyone saying that he was doing it for money. So that he came 
and he preached and we're told that he, he worked hard. Well, we know that he was a tent maker and uh, that's presumably what he was doing. And he uses the words that we could translate toiling and moiling. It was hard work when he was amongst them. You know our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. So he was, uh, he was careful not to give offence. There's a right place to take money and there's a wrong place. We need wisdom. And then his purity of life. Now he says here in verse 10, you are witnesses and so is God of how holy, righteous and blameless we were among you who believe. Now this may be his answer to some sort of, there seems to be answers to accusations in this passage if you read it. People have been saying things and perhaps there'd been an allegation of sexual impropriety and he's able to say, you know, your witnesses. He says something stronger than you know. He says, you are witnesses. You saw us. You saw the way we acted. These things are not true. And look at how he describes his light, way of life among them in three terms. His holiness, that is his attitude to God, was right. He sought with all his heart to live in accordance with God's laws. His belief in God internally was mirrored by his love for God externally and worked out in his holiness of life. His righteousness, his attitude to those men with whom he had to do was right. None of them could justly accuse him of partiality, of theft, of dishonesty, of any sort of immorality. And then blamelessness. He's, this seems to reinforce what he's been saying consistently. He's blameless in his conduct before God and therefore he's blameless in his conduct before men. And that's always the order that we need to follow. If we want to live properly before men, we have to live properly before God. We can act in a way that makes us look like we're living properly before men, but if we're not living properly before God, then it it'll all come crashing down around us. So although we'll often be accused of being standoffish or divisive or hard line in our position about the truth, we, we don't need to make it worse by being nasty. We need to be clear, honest, righteous, holy, blameless, even when we have to say hard things to people, knowing if our word is rejected, it is the word of God that's rejected and that the truth will come out in the day of judgment. So the third thing then is the purpose of a true ministry. And that's really the rest of it. Um, verses 11 to 16, in which Paul says, well, the first thing is that we have a fatherly concern for them. I, I love this passage. I, I remember speaking to a, an absolutely brilliant missionary. I say this advisedly. And we were just sitting in his study talking about the scriptures. And, and I, I don't know why it came up, but it did. And I happen to say, isn't it interesting the way the Lord uses the word of God to describe either himself or his servants as fathers or mothers and things like that and we were just chatting about that because it comes up in Isaiah and things like that and I said it's quite strange isn't it in 1 Thessalonians 2 how Paul describes himself as a father and a mother and uh, this missionary said do you know I never thought of that wait a minute and he reached up on his shelf and got his Greek New Testament down because he reads it in Greek and he you know he said he does too doesn't he and the difference is there's the tenderness of the mother and the seriousness of the father. He has a fatherly concern for them. We, you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you 
to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So this is what Paul does as a minister, a desire to impart important principles, encouraging them, pointing out and correcting errors, a willingness to be a source of comfort, comforting them, a readiness to take the proper disciplinary action, urging them. And sometimes pastors, when they come to preach to us, sometimes when we're listening to God's word, we need to receive it in these ways, being challenged by it, being encouraged by it, being comforted by it, so that we will live lives worthy of God who calls us into his kingdom and glory. And then he wants to impart God's word to them. There's this fantastic passage here, which is a challenge to every preacher. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. And the challenge is, when we hear preaching, who do we hear? Do we hear the preacher? Or do we hear God speaking through the preacher? He shows us then, through God's word, that we've got examples that we can imitate. Elsewhere, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Uh, here he says, imitate the churches in Judea. You became imitators of God's churches in Judea. Well, he's taking them back to the very early days of the church, to the martyrdom of Stephen, to the persecution that fell on the churches in Judea, to the, the way that uh, missionaries like Paul were pushed out of Judea. There was great persecution, and yet the churches stood. The churches survived. The churches were still there, and Paul says that's what you must do. In the midst of persecution, you stand. And that's, I think, at least that's what I think he's saying here. And then, in saying that, he's saying to this young church, look, you're doing well, but you're going to get more suffering. You're going, it's going to keep on coming. Don't think it's going to stop. Look back to those early churches in Judea. Look back to the thousands converted on the day of Pentecost. And the many others converted in the coming days after that. And then, bang, persecution comes. And don't think it's not going to happen to you too. And we need to bear that in mind. If, if the Lord hears our prayers and suddenly blesses us by bringing people in under the sound of the gospel, through the book table or through our meeting people and inviting them in, let's not think that suddenly everything's going to be wonderful. Because it's likely that challenges will come with it. But then he reminds them too that as well as we can expect suffering, those who bring the persecution upon the church can expect the judgment of God on them. Some people think that Paul's words here are unnecessarily harsh, but actually... I think his words agree with the words of the Lord himself when he spoke to the Pharisees. When he told them, remember, there was the seven woes. He spoke against the Pharisees. And he was very powerful in his condemnation of them. So as we finish, well, we've heard about Paul as a mother and a father. And every parent wants to hear people say, your child is a credit to you. And that's what Paul wants from the Thessalonian Christians. And that's the challenge for each one of us as we seek to hear God's word and obey it. Let me finish with probably the key verse of the book, or half a verse actually, chapter 4, verse 3. It is God's will that you be sanctified. That's the 
That's what Paul's interested in. And that's what the true minister of the gospel is interested in. Amen.